We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, but what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do, I do. And if I do what I, want, what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So if I am this law at work, although I want to do evil, to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who would rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Thank you. 
various reasons. First of all, we don't want to think of ourselves as sinners. How negative. How can you go through life thinking you're a rotten sinner and have self-confidence? How can you do that? All you guys at church, you're talking about sin all the time. It's so boring. We don't want that, thank you. It'll make us really depressed. Another reason is they do not know the law of God. It isn't taught these days. The modern moral compass is drifting further and further away from the law of God. But when you come across the law of God, you can see that you're not as good as you thought you were. And that's one of the things which we saw from the reading which Lydia read. St. Paul is writing. At the time when he thought he was a good person, because he didn't understand the law of God, it may well be that one of his, favorite, uh, his weak points was covetousness. He uses that in, in the passage. But he doesn't take any notice of it, that's just the way he is. Until he discovers that covetousness is a sin. He discovers the law of God and he's horrified. He realizes what a wicked man he is. He says, when I heard the law, I died. It's the law which is the light which shines in our hearts. And another reason for thinking I'm a good person is because everybody's doing it. You know, Oakington is a very nice place to live, very nice community. People pay their taxes, look after their kids and work hard. So, compared to them, I'm a good person, they're a good person, we're all good. And this is what we see around us, isn't it? And actually, as I look around, I think myself, well, I actually think I'm rather nicer than that good person over there. But just because you think you're a good person and do good works, it doesn't mean to say that you actually are good. Hitler's secretary died fairly recently, well over a hundred. She said, you know what? I really liked working for Hitler. He was a really nice man. I really liked working for him. I didn't want to change my job, and she didn't. Just because we do good things doesn't mean to say we are good. And our good works are not done for other people. They're done for me. Because if I don't do good works out there, I shall get drummed out of the village. Like that rather antisocial couple a few years ago who got thrown out by the council because of their antisocial behaviour. And vicars have to watch it too. Watch it too. Because if you say the wrong things, the community doesn't like it. So they turn against you and, and they want you to go. So out of fear of man, you say all the things which please everybody. However, in exact contrast to that, as you heard in the Bible, the whole point is that we are actually sinners. That's why we need saving. And looking at Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 31 and 2, this is what he says. Uh, then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourself for your sins and detestable practices. That's a very strong word, isn't it? You will loathe yourself. But when we discover the real depth of our sinnership and the nature of it, we can't sit light to that. And you'll notice if you read this chapter, this comes just after what God says in verse 26, 5. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your iniquities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You see, when you get born again, the light goes on in your spirit and then you can see things that you didn't see before. I don't know about you, but I get up when it's pitch dark, get out of bed, can't see a thing, nothing. You think there was nothing there. But when I put the light on, boom, everything becomes, there is all this. When the light of the Holy Spirit goes on, you can see your nature. When Lisa and I moved into Oakington, big house, we didn't have any furniture or not enough, so we went round the sale rooms buying up stuff, which was broken because it was cheaper, and I did it up. And after a while I thought, do you know what, James, you're a pretty good carpenter. Your education wasn't in vain. I look at the stuff I've done, think you can't tell anybody's been at that. But I distinctly remember going to visit a cabinet maker at Chatteris. I can't remember why we were going there, but anyway, went to him and he kindly showed us around his workshop. I 
was mightily impressed. He was, he was doing, making some marketry. And he showed me, uh, well, it, it, it's a, the technical term is it's, it name is, it's a marketry donkey. And he uses it for cutting different coloured veneers. And then he stuck them all together. He was just making this piece. It was, I, I mean, I was dazzled by it. I thought, you are a real craftsman. And then I thought to myself, <laughs> you're no carpenter, James, you're just a bodger. When you look at that kind of thing, you can see how poor your efforts are. When the Holy Spirit shines a light into our hearts, that's when we can see our true nature. Just taking a few examples from Scripture, Job 42 verse 5. Job has been complaining, you see, everything's gone up in smoke, and um, he's grumbling, and his friends say to him, you're, it's because you're a wicked man, God has paid you out for your sins. Job refuses to accept that. No, he said, I, I'm not a, sin, a sinner, I'm not, it's not because of my sins. And his friends keep on at him, confess Job, don't hide it, confess your sin, you will be forgiven. But he insists, it's not like that. <coughs> But nevertheless, he complains, but he doesn't go off God. Curse God and die, they say, but he refuses. And then, God turns up and reveals to Job his glorious majesty. And Job says this in verse 5. My, hear, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself. And I repent in just dust and ashes. Um, King David, Psalm 51. David has committed adultery and then murdered the husband of the woman with whom Bathsheba, with whom he committed adultery. And do you know what? He doesn't. He doesn't take any notice of it. He doesn't seem to care. He goes home, has an ice cream, sits in the patio. It doesn't seem to register. This is extraordinary. Maybe it's because he wants the king. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Until the prophet Nathan came along with a word from God and it shone a light into David's situation. And immediately he saw what a dreadful thing he'd done because he was so he because of his sin, he acknowledges it. Psalm 51 is worth reading. It's the is how he feels when the light goes on in his spirit. Against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth. In sin has my mother conceived me. You see? Isaiah is another one. Isaiah is a Christian. He goes to church every Sunday to the 10 o'clock service in the morning. He arrives at 9.30 to ring the bells. And then he settles down to the service. When the sermon starts, he starts to doze off. <laughs> but then, God turns up in glorious majesty. He sees the seraphim and hears their praises. And immediately, he realizes his sinnership. Woe is me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. You see, compared to the searing goodness of God, that's the, I think possibly it's the only place where we can see the true depth of our sonship. Another one is Luke 5, verse 8. Um, so Peter, Peter and the disciples are out fishing, they catch nothing, terribly frustrating. They're really annoyed. All night they've been out there, nothing. So Jesus says, well, cast the net out onto the other side. And Peter thinks to himself, so what? What do you know about fishing? You're not a fisherman, you're a carpenter. I'm a professional fisherman, I know how things work. I haven't caught anything too bad. However, he does cast the net on the other side. And as you know, he catches an enormous load of fishes so that the net breaks. And when he sees this glory, he says, uh, where are we now? Verse 8, is it? Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And one more example is St. Paul, whom we've heard about in the reading. That whole reading, verse 7, is Paul acknowledging his sinnership. And in 1 Timothy 1.13, he says this. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor,
persecutor and a violent man. In the light of that glorious revelation on the Damascus Road, Paul tumbles to the truth about himself. When he was murdering the church and arresting everybody and trying to stop it, close it down, he thought he was doing a work for God. You know, the deception of which we are capable is profound and disturbing. But that's our nature. So going back to Ezekiel 33, you will loathe yourself. So three reasons, I think, maybe others, why, why that becomes that um, sense of our citizenship. And the first thing is because it's so, we were so stupid. These people to whom Ezekiel is talking have been taken away into exile. God gave them the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. He went out with their armies. He blessed them with prosperity and peace. He defended them. But they, they, didn't, they didn't fulfill their obligations. They gave up on God. They went into all sorts of alternative spiritualities. Spiritualism, idol worship and so on. They erected Asherah pearls all over the place. Superstition. They even erected altars to the Queen of Heaven in the temple. At one point the temple was locked. Uh, I suppose because it was considered rather redundant and it became very dilapidated. God sent them many, many warnings over many decades. Prophets rose up, priests, and told them, but they didn't take any notice, they rejected God. Until wickedness reached a height which caused God to move against them. Just before then, there was a revival under King Josiah. But God said that wasn't enough. Wickedness has to be paid for. So when Josiah died and under his sons, God sent King Nebuchadnezzar and uh, uh, captured the whole country and took the whole um, population of the city away into Babylon, leaving just a few poor people. So when they got to Babylon and looked back at what they had lost, this fantastic inheritance which they were freely given, they looked back and they saw that it was entirely their own stupid fault. They were to blame. The good people of Oakington pass the church every day, read the posters Mary Jane puts up, uh, pick up the magazine off the doormat, you might even go and have a light supper with the vicar, perhaps come to the concert, Engage with us. We have many friends in the village. We talk about Jesus. But they didn't take any notice. In fact, they thought it would, they, they rejected it. They curled up their lip at it. They mocked it. It's okay for you guys. We're fine. We're strong. We don't need, we don't need a prop. We can live our own life, thanks. Living without God and dying without God, you end up in eternity. Jesus said, in describing the pains of hell, uh, it's like a worm which never dies. I wonder about that. Now, what does that mean? I wonder if it's this self-deprecation. Because you, one of the things you realize when you, when you get there is your own stupid fault that you were there. You were so silly. You didn't listen. All the time, year after year, there were opportunities God stretched out his hand to you, but you just kicked it away because of sheer pride. You wanted to do your own thing. We don't need all that. I'm fine. I'm getting on well. I'm living a good life. So you reject his salvation. What on earth will you think of yourself when you get there? It's nobody else's fault. You're paying for your own sins. That's justice. You didn't take up the offer of Jesus. The blood of Christ. I think that will gnaw and eat at you. It will gnaw away at your bones eternally. I think that's what it means. And another reason, I think, is ingratitude. What's not to like about God? God is love. He pours out his kindness and patience upon us. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Year after year, decade after decade, God's love reaches out towards us, especially in salvation. 
and we reject. What an outrage this is that the eternal God came in Christ, taken on our nature, born of a virgin, and dies that horrible death so that we might end up in the city of God. But we just curl up our lips with a snarl and turn away from it. I can understand people having trouble with the moral compass of God. It's a real challenge being a Christian. It's such a challenge to the self-life. It's not for the faint-hearted. I can understand people not finding it very easy to get their heads around Christian doctrine and what appear to be contradictions and things like the suffering. These are very big um, questions and they really they take sometimes a lifetime to get your head around. I can understand people bridling at that, but apart. To push love out of the way is just such an average when you consider the cost of our salvation. What will God say to those people who rejected the Son of God? What will he say to them? They're the ones who crucified him. Jesus didn't go to the cross because he had a sin. It was the sins of them. And us today were the same people. Human nature doesn't change. My sins, my crimes of life, my vanity, my lusts, that's what puts Jesus on the cross, which rules him out, I mean, and tries to get rid of God. What will God say? when that happens. I remember um, Jeff Power, in his testimony, uh, he said that when he was young, I don't know when it was, he was an atheist, he found himself in church. I don't know what the occasion was. Anyway, communion came around, the bread and the wine. And when they got to Jeff, the uh, vicar gave him the bread, and Jeff said, where's the jack? When he became a Christian, that came back to Jeff, and he was utterly horrified that he should so snarl, really, and turn up his lip at the body broken for him. He felt that that could be one of the sins which is unforgivable. It isn't, and he realized it wasn't. But Jeff became extremely grateful for his salvation. And another thing, a, a third reason for loathing ourselves is we realize that our nature is base, basically, and we realize our citizenship and that we, we loved, we loved sin. And is this not what we see today? Some of the things which God hates, we love and celebrate. There's a list of the things God hates in the Bible. All the way through, there's no doubt about what God hates. There's a list in Proverbs. All through the New and Old Testaments, we get hold of it. That's what God thinks about these things. That's how he sees them. So that's how they are. God is not mistaken. In his light, he can see the base things. But some of these, we celebrate. We teach them to children. We celebrate. This is a great thing. This is a good lifestyle. Children are told, you can take this up, and that's fine. And we, we celebrate them because we love them. Why do we love things which are base? That says a great deal about our nature. It shows us how base we are, how vile, and what contemptible uh, things are rising up within us. When you come to see, because God shows you what he thinks, you begin to loathe yourself of these things. And unaccountably, I think, and very challengingly, the church, aspects of the church take these things on board. Is the church not the very place where we should see clearly what we're dealing with? Because we're born again, hopefully, and filled with the Holy Spirit. There's such a lot of religion about these days. Scaffolding, it is. That's, not, that's fine. It's there to lead us to Jesus' feet. But you can get stuck on the scaffolding. Because you like it. You like the music, you like the liturgy, you like the social side, you like the people. We do have to be careful of this, folks. So where do you and I stand in terms of conviction of sin? As natural born men and women, we love 
of sin. We love life without God. We love things which are vile and base and horrible and dirty and full of darkness. We love these things naturally and we cannot see for the life of us what is wrong with them. But then we have another side. You and I have changed kingdoms. The Spirit of God rises up within us. And as we live out of our spirits, the light shines. It does shine. Where do you and I stand with this conviction of sin? Is there self-loathing? I suppose it's a scale where we don't suddenly loathe ourselves. When revival comes, we do. In revival, people are crawling around on the floor. You know, if you can read the stories, it's astonishing. They're in agony. Oh God, save me. They realize the horror of their life because in revival, the light shines so strongly. And people ring up the vicar and say, what have you done? What's going on? You must stop this. You mustn't say all this. Thing. You've got to help them to uh, be happy. But if you're sensible, you don't do that. You, you present them until they come through with forgiveness. And then tremendous joy comes upon them as they, just, as they understand forgiveness. Let us seek God. That the Holy Spirit will reveal to us that the light will shine, so shine, that we are relieved of these terrible delusions which so characterize our society today. Everybody's doing it, everybody thinks it. It's so easy to take it on board. Well, don't let's take any notice of what you or I think. But let us seek the Holy Spirit that the light may shine. And do you know what? We've changed kingdoms. Our sins are forgiven. That's fantastic, isn't it? The price is paid. So let us seek Jesus that we may enter into this reality and uh, live in the sunshine of this marvelous forgiveness. The first work of the Holy Spirit